Okay, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Adarsh Ganesan. I hope I pronounced that more or less right. Um, Adarsh did his undergraduate studies at um, Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India in electrical engineering and electronics engineering. And then he did a PhD at the University of Cambridge in the UK in 2017 and has joined NIST in 2018. And um, he's been working on uh, phononic frequency combs and photonic frequency combs are well known, but uh, applying this same ID to phonons is uh, new. And that's what he's gonna tell us about today. So with that, go ahead. Um, we can't hear you. Your mic is not on. Adarsh, is your mic on? I don't, I don't hear you. Does anybody else hear him? No, Adarsh, we couldn't hear you. Can you try again? Okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good, we're good. Okay, that's good, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, th thanks for the introduction and sorry for the initial troubles. Okay, so phononic frequency combs, um, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, so before I actually go into that, uh, so let me talk about frequency comb. Frequency comb is actually an array of equidistant frequencies. That's what it looks in the frequency domain, a series of equidistant frequencies. In the time domain, these frequencies all add up together to become these mode lock pulses. So that's the time domain picture and that's the frequency domain picture. Um, so why these combs were popular? So unlike radio frequencies, uh, the frequency of fast moving light oscillations cannot be measured using conventional electronics. People had to uh, down convert light uh, and then estimate via calibration. And that's how people did it. Um, so you have very fast moving oscillations, you down convert it somehow, and then you measure it via calibration. But then this multi stage process causes imprecision in. Uh, frequency and therefore there is an imprecision in optical frequency metrology. Um, and the precision itself became the theme in optical metrology after the introduction of a frequency comb concept. Basically, you had this very simple idea here. So you have a very stable frequency comb, well calibrated frequency combs. You know all the frequencies very well to very high level of stability. You, you know everything very well about the combs. So now if you come up with an unknown laser frequency, uh, it's not all that unknown. You roughly know what the frequency is, but you don't know the exact value. You probably know it is like 435 nanometers, but you don't know if it is 435 on what, what, what. So you wanted to know that. And to know that basically uh, you take that unknown laser frequency, somehow that frequency is going to be between two of the comb lines, so those are farther apart. Uh, so somehow your line is going to be between that, you know that, and uh, you're going to beat it against it and you get a beat node. So with that number, you could know, estimate what the actual laser frequency is. So that extra minus thing, you need to like substitute it back to get the exact laser frequency. And that's how the precision in optical frequency metrology became possible. Uh, so the other applications came in, that's the gold application, that's the big application of uh, frequency comb. And the other applications came in as the concept became popular. People were able to make optical clocks. People use this to drive optical atomic clocks and people could create arbitrary RF waveforms, which we couldn't actually generate it like that in our domain itself. Uh, this concept really brought some interesting signal processing into the RF domain. Uh, and people were able to do molecular spectroscopy. Supposing if you have a gas of molecules and you wanted to do a rapid spectroscopy, rapid absorption spectroscopy, then you have all these uh, distinct frequency lines, frequency comb lines of optical combs. 
that is interface that is made to interface with these uh, molecular clouds and and then you get a nice absorption profile uh, very rapidly so these are different applications um yes it got uh, the recognition that it deserved um so optical combs have been around for a while uh, and now that's the pitch uh, so i gave the first experimental evidence for mechanical frequency combs uh, actually, if you can note in the paper, it's phononic frequency combs. Actually, uh, so these are the first uh, uh, phonon frequency combs. Just to quick get a quick idea about what the frequency ranges are in these frequency combs. Uh, so these are all in megahertz. Since I work with the mechanical devices, uh, very big mechanical devices, that's why the frequencies are low. But uh, it's quite straightforward to scale it up to bigger frequencies like in gigahertz or uh, higher megahertz. So it's it's possible. And, and these are the estimates, the first of frequency comb uh, that have these numbers. Uh, so, so these are the mode lock pulses, just like an optical frequency comb. So you also have similar mode lock pulsing in the phononic domain, and that paper shows that. Uh, so there's also some spatial heterogeneity in the comb profiles. So at some point you get a stronger comb, some point you get a weaker comb. Uh, th there are interesting uh, dynamics associated with it uh, that basically drives these heterogeneities, uh, spatial heterogeneities. Um, so, so these are the different names, as I told. Uh, so in the paper I published uh, with the title, uh, Phononic Frequency Combs, but it could be phononic, it could be mechanical, it could be vibrational, or it could be acoustic, all mean the same. It could be also ultrasonic, for instance. Uh, phononic could be interesting for physics and material science community, condensed matter physics, uh, material science, mechanical physics, optomechanics, uh, and also for mechanical engineering, vibrational for molecular sciences, acoustic for electrical engineers, signal processing people, uh, so these are different terminologies. Uh, so we got a recognition for this work. Um, so in a uh, nutshell, I describe a system that can create several equidistant frequencies out of one frequency only. Uh, so yes, so let us consider a mechanical device. So that's the mechanical device. Uh, so you have different layers, different colors in there. So silicon, uh, blue color there. Uh, that's the structure, that's the major mechanical body. And on top of that, I've coded aluminum nitride and aluminum. So aluminum nitride, they are very thin aluminum nitride, which is coated on silicon structure, aluminum, very thin aluminum coated on top of it. These are for electrical actuation and readout. So aluminum nitride for piezoelectric actuation. So as I give electrical signal into the device and that gets transported through aluminum metal electrode and then gets into aluminum nitride and gets polarized and you get the mechanical motion there. So that's the general idea about the device and how it actually works. So if I give a sinusoidal signal, then you're basically sinusoidally oscillating, mechanically vibrating the system. And, and as it does that, uh, so you see the structure vibrating. So that's the idea about this. So. So this is how we model the motion of the mechanical device upon uh, injected with a force, the sinusoidal force. So your EAI cos omega dt is the sinusoidal force. Um, and these are the different energy terms. So kinetic energy, potential energy, drive energy, and modal interactions. Altogether, this forms in Hamiltonian to describe the dynamics of this full mechanical system. Uh, so if the interesting part here also comes from the modal interactions. So that, that's what is actually driving the phononic frequency comb process. Um, okay, so let us closely watch uh, the input AI. So AI is here. Uh, so that's what we wanted to watch closely. Supposing if that AI is going to be less than a threshold, some threshold value, some power threshold. And if it is, if it is going to be lower than that, and now we are supplying a signal, omega d, with a power lower than the threshold. What you should be getting out is a single tone uh, with the amplitude determined by how far that omega d is away from the resonance frequency of the mechanical device. So that is what is gonna constitute uh, the motion. That's how the motion is gonna be characterized. 
but then if it is going to be about threshold, this is not going to work. This simple math does not hold true if AI is going to go about a threshold. And that's when the surprise comes in and that's when we get frequency codes. So, so we have AI about a threshold and we get frequency codes. And that's what it is. Uh, and wondering what happened? Uh, so this driven extension compression mode. I'm trying to drive a mode. I'm trying to drive a driven uh, trying to drive an extension compression mode in the device with that omega D. So omega D is closer to that resonance mode and I'm driving it. And that mode starts to couple with other modes. How? That's the way. So that particular term forms the root for coupling to other modes. Uh, so, and then you get frequency combs. So in this case, I'm driving one mode. You can also drive two modes simultaneously. So if in, in the case, I'm driving one mode, the frequency comb is there, and there is also a frequency comb spacing. And the spacing is actually determined by how far that omega D is away from the omega naught. So the, the basically the spacing controls the frequency comb, uh, the, the separation of omega D and omega naught is going to control the, sep the spacing of frequency combs. Okay, so now supposing if I drive two modes rather than one mode, so I have two modes here, and if I'm driving somewhere at the middle, omega D. So now this can couple to two different modes. It can either couple to omega one or it can couple to omega two. And what actually happens if it couples to omega one, then you get a frequency comb of spacing omega D minus omega one. Uh, if it couples to omega two, then you get a spacing omega D minus omega two. Uh, yes, but what actually happens, whether it couples to omega one or omega two, so that was a curiosity at the time. And then I uh, did the experiment to show that you have two different comb regimes. One talks about a comb that has the spacing determined by omega D minus omega one. The other one determined by omega D minus omega two. And the blue combs and green combs have their own regions where it, it exists. So that's the interesting thing. And there are many more interesting things in this, uh, the whole world of phononics. Uh, so when we get which combs and how better we can make this. So to understand all that, we need a framework upon which we could be studying phononic combs. And that's, what, that's the framework. So that's the framework that is going to offer the total dynamical uh, complexity of uh, in, to understand the fuller scope of what we can do with phononic homes and how all we could engineer phononic homes. So that's the, the idea here. Um, so my doctoral research established the fundamental papers. Uh, so the first paper, I proved the existence of uh, phononic homes, uh, which I did it here. Um, then I established a major leap from two mode to three mode interactions because if this is what if this is going to be true, this has to, if this is going to be true, then the two mode exists. But if this is going to be universally true, then the three three mode also exists. So that is something that I proved here. So if this term is there at all to create phononicums, this is also possible. It's also possible to create phononicums out of three modal interactions. Uh, we did this, and then uh, we got a silent uh, uh, write up on this work as well. Um, so, yes, so then I established the major leap from one driven mode to two driven modes, and then to basically demonstrate the complexity of phononic homes. And there is more richer things to be studying in this field. So, that is that's what I established here. Um, then I established an instrumentation technique, a new instrumentation technique. So here I wanted to show that resonance tracking of mechanical resonator is possible without the need for an external electrical feedback circuit. Supposing if I give you a mechanical resonator and the resonator and there is a frequency of that mechanical resonator. And I wanted to track that. I wanted to know what that frequency is. Conventionally, how people do that is by constructing a feedback loop and then measure how, what comes out of the uh, the system, and then they know that frequency, and then they match. So basically, they did an ex external feedback circuitry, and then they know what the frequency is. But what this paper shows is that you don't need the external feedback circuitry at all, and the the, the phononic comb response in itself basically gives you that uh, flexibility and opportunity to basically track your residence frequency.
Um, just that it has got some analogies, just that instead of having an electronic feedback, we have an intrinsic mechanical feedback itself, uh, which we are not constructing externally, which is intrinsically present, and we are leveraging that to uh, basically construct this new paradigm. So this is the old paradigm, conventional. Uh, so you have these things going away, and in the coma-based approach, you basically have just this. You have a resonator body, and then you hit it with a omega-D frequency, and then you basically extract omega naught. Okay. That's it. Um, so yes, the timeline. So uh, yes, so here. So I have to track it. Uh, so then, what I then went on to do is phononic combs can uh, be used to engineer MEMSNEMS devices with tunable sensitivity. So phononic combs can enable dynamical tuning of sensitivity of devices without knowing their details. So if I have a MEMS device, just a device, a bare device, I can either turn that into a, a, you know, a magnetometer or I can turn it into a sensitive thermometer or I can turn it into something which is insensitive to any physical perturbations. For instance, it could be used, it could be used for a frequency reference applications. Uh, so th there are possibilities to do it. Uh, so the, how I established it uh, is by this. So you have a frequency comb response here uh, and these are all different frequency combs. And you can see as I change the temperature, uh, the frequency shift for all these, all these frequencies shift, uh, except the center one, center one stays fixed because the dry frequency, the other frequencies uh, shift with uh, temperature. So let me pick the N equals four line. Uh, basically it symmetrically uh, shifts. So N equals four line is there, and then I'm plotting it here for different dry conditions. You can see uh, the frequency shift is positive uh, for dry conditions, 22 dB, but it is negative for 21 dB. Supposing if I'm having a comb, which is driven at a little higher power, so the entire structure is basically responding in a negative temperature sensitive way. But um, if I'm putting it at slightly below, then it is responding in a positive way. So there's clearly some interesting thing that is happening in the device. Uh, Basically, there is some very interesting complex modal interactions. Um, there are different energy turns with different temperature sensitivities. They're all coupling together to create some novel temperature responses. And, and that is something interesting because this is only temperature, but you can, it can also be something uh, related to magnetic field, or it could be related to something else, uh, let's say an acceleration or other things. So in which case, you will have all interesting complex sensitivities coming together and reacting in an interesting way. This way, one could draw interesting non-orthogonal relationships using which one can try to configure the device uh, into whatever they want. Uh, so what I really wanted to show from the figure is that uh, this basically entails this possibility for doing all those complex uh, sensitive, sensitive measurements, uh, which could be used for different applications within the sensing world. Uh, anyway, so that's the paper that I published and I presented the results at the IEEE census conference uh, for the engineering community. Um, so this is all I did, and then this is all I did outside of homes. And uh, basically, we proved the long-known concepts of nonlinear optics in the domain of vibrations. Uh, so nonlinear optics concepts have been around for a long time. One of the concepts is frequency comb, but there are other concepts. So basically, in this paper, in these, in this body of work, I basically try to explore those. Okay. So until now, the goal has been to study the depth breadth and neighborhood of phononicums. So not just concentrating on phononicums alone, but where all it could go and what is the other uh, possibilities that it could enable. Uh, so those are all something that I was exploring. Uh, so despite several papers on phononicums, there's still a major missing block. Uh, basically there was a major, major missing block uh, and that uh, is basically what are the existence conditions for phononicums. So now that I said you hit it with hit a mechanical resonator with a single frequency, then you get a frequency comb, right? Uh, but then when we should excite it, what are the conditions? 
uh, when we get the codes. So then this, uh, as an is postdoc, I figured that out. So the perturbation theory eliminated the existence conditions of non echoes. Uh, so that's the model, two mode coupled together. And then you have omega two less than omega one by two is one region and omega two greater than omega one by two is another region. So you have two modes coupling together and their frequencies are roughly one off of each other, but still uh, there are subtle variations. So omega two minus omega one by two is not zero, but it's, it has got some finite value. So, so and, and basically this is one case and that's another case. And you can see there are two black lines and there's A1 and omega D. A1 is the drive power. So I'm driving it. So there is a frequency and there is a power. So that power is here and then the frequency is here. And there's this black line. So if you're going above the black line, if your power and frequency goes above the back line, uh, then uh, you get those two modes to interact with each other. So the two modes starts to interact with each other about this black line. But the frequency comb is, has got something more interesting and it, it only happens uh, about this red line. So anywhere above the red line, you get a frequency comb. Uh, meaning, so that's the threshold for modal coupling and that's the threshold for frequency codes. Um, so anywhere in that particular region, you should be uh, seeing uh, phononic codes. Um, so that is what I uh, showed in this paper. Um, so yes, so that is interesting. So that something clear right now where we get, when we get frequency codes, right? So now uh, the question is the next step. So can combs be realized only in mechanical oscillators, uh, solid materials? Uh, what about nanoparticles? What about nanoclusters? What about molecules? So these are all different uh, physical systems where phononic combs could manifest in. Uh, so in that way, you can have broader uh, interest for phononic combs. So yes, so all these possibilities for phononic combs remain to be seen. Um, I mean, as combs uh, gain attention, my goal for the near term is uh, to explore the engineering applications of phononic combs in material and molecular sciences. Uh, to that end, uh, in the last year, I was actually collaborating with two different groups, uh, one for material combs, the other for molecular sciences, molecular combs. One uh, young researcher, the other very well established researcher on a search of retirement. So two different groups uh, for uh, progressing on phononic combs. So I'll talk about the first result on material combs uh, with this uh, group, uh, Pranahan Arang's group at Harvard. So we have recently, we are publishing a paper now. Uh, so that's the result. So indium manganese oxide. So we have a material there and we have this potential energy surface for the material. Um, so there are two modes interacting with each other in this material, X mode and Goldstone modes. And those two modes interact in a particular potential. Uh, so that potential is characterized here. That is the surface, potential energy surface. So yes, uh, so I did this and then uh, so he's one of the major contributors of this work is currently an assistant professor. So last so last year he was a postdoc at Harvard. Now he's an assistant professor at Tel Aviv. Uh, so, that, so that's the idea here. So it relies on phonon-phonon phone -on coupling. So, so phonon-phonon phone -on coupling uh, conventionally uh, is done in this manner. So our new paradigm is this. So conventionally, the optical phonon -on coupling to an acoustic phonon -on has been the thing. And that is a deteriorating phenomenon in the semiconductors. So this leads to, uh, so supposing if there are electrical uh, excitations, electron, electrons moving, moving, in, in moving in the materials and that electron transport is uh, being hindered by these electron phonon interactions mediated through this acoustic optical phonon, uh, acoustic phonon interactions. And this acoustic phonon is usually dissipated as heat. Uh, that's the conventional phonon phonon coupling that we are talking about. But there is also an interesting phonon phonon coupling that could happen, which is an optical phonon coupling with an optical phonon. So, an optical phonon can couple with an optical phonon. 
So those have this kind of dance diagram and, and that basically could be interesting. Uh, and we demonstrated something uh, interesting from there. Uh, so that's the nonlinear potential of indium manganese oxide. So that's, there's a potential energy surface and that's the potential. Uh, but then it's quite interesting for this material is that the D and E coefficients are very low and effectively you could neglect those terms. Um, so in a manner that you get a very simple potential and in this potential, uh, there are very few ways this could interact, uh, things could interact, the phonons could interact. So if your omega, so IR, so the IR frequency is close to R. So there are two optical phonons interacting with each other, but those two are not uh, IR active. Both are not IR active. One is IR active, one is Raman active. So one Raman active mode is interacting with an IR frequency. And then, uh, and then they have a very interesting frequency matching condition, which is kind of necessary for observing phononic ohms. Uh, so that is there. Uh, so then what we do is then we excite the material with a terahertz pulses. So we have a terahertz pulse. So you excite it with a terahertz pulse. What happens? You excite it. So the frequency of the terahertz pulse, the carrier wave is actually, uh, uh, the frequency is closer to the Higgs mode. So you're resonantly exciting the Higgs mode. Uh, and then as you, as the terahertz pulse uh, basically decays uh, here, uh, you still have the excitation going on. And then the phonon modes decay at a little slower rate because of the damping involved. Uh, so, uh, so yes, that um, is basically decaying. But that is not the very interesting thing here. The interesting thing here, as the Higgs excitation continues to stay, there is this coupling between Higgs mode and the uh, Goldstone mode. And, and that basically leads to some interesting features. So as basically this go, goes down and it's not going that down, it still has enough energy in it for it to couple to the Goldstone mode. And as the interaction happens, there is a slow buildup of Goldstone oscillations. And this oscillates in a manner that you get a uh, interesting pulse strains rather than a steep, rather than a, a, a single frequency or single amplitude, but their the amplitude fluctuates here. And this comes as a frequency comb in the, in the Fourier domain. Uh, in the time domain, it's also interesting. Uh, it manifests as the pulse strain. It is not that, there's not the only interesting thing. There's also an interesting thing here is the phase, there's a phase difference between these uh, phonon oscillations. So there's this phase difference. And that is kind of interesting. That sets the limit on whether or not we could excite phononic ohms in materials. So I've been showing some processes by which we could create phononic ohms in materials. Uh, so this is a process that I'm talking about here. Uh, so what does it actually signify? So that phase difference, that if, if at all they are basically lining exactly on top of each, each other, then this, the solution isn't stable. In that, you don't get frequency combs. That uh, phase difference has to be there and that has to be maintained. Uh, so phononic combs can only exist when there is a frequency mismatch between the nonlinearly interacting mode. And that interaction and that condition is said like this. So it depends on the damping coefficients of the materials. So you have different modes in the materials. Now uh, the phonon, different phonon modes have different dissipation rates and it depends on the dissipation rates. Uh, and that is going to set the limit for how far these frequencies have to be shifted. Uh, so very interesting. And, uh, and th there's an interesting, uh, uh, very insightful uh, formula to understand when we actually create phononic ohms in materials. Um, so in materials, unlike mechanical systems where I can continuously drive. So here, uh, people usually, uh, the community usually work with the terahertz pulses and then try to do the experiments. So I'm kind of tailoring the ideas uh, to the community too. So as if they wanted to really excite it, then they have to, they could be doing it in this particular manner. Okay. So this uh, work that provides the existence conditions for phononic homes for the first time. So that's all about materials. Now, uh, 
go, going to the next uh, idea about can we can I excite phononicums and molecules? So yes. So then I prove this concept as well. Uh, supposing if I have molecules, right? So people do interesting things with laser interacting with molecules and do many interesting research around that. So supposing if you have SIBO molecules in a gas chamber and you can have a terahertz pulse interacting with the molecules. And what you can do with this is by doing this interesting vibrational excitation, you could transfer the phonons from the ground state and transfer it into the uh, higher levels uh, by this. But you can do it in a more interesting way that you could create some interesting uh, spectral features coming from the molecular uh, molecule, molecular excitation, molecular vibrations. You could create an interesting uh, spe uh, spectrum. So one spectrum could be a frequency combs. And, and interestingly, one can tailor the pulses. You can tailor the pulses and then that is hitting the molecules uh, in a manner you can excite it in different ways. One can optimize it in a manner that one could create 27 harmonic to be the highest uh, frequency compared to the first harmonic or one can make it into whatever they want. So one can create some interesting arbitrary spectra coming from the molecular sciences and that could provide interesting knobs in the coherent molecular control. Uh, so, which is kind of interesting for the community there too. Uh, so yes, uh, tomorrow I'm actually giving, presenting these papers at I IUS, International Ultrasonic Symposium. So we have a full session on phononic frequency booms. Uh, so there are different papers from different research groups. Um, so yes, I'm giving two uh, talks. So one is on the materials, one is on the molecules. Uh, that's tomorrow. Okay, so these foundational material and molecular home results are now being established. So what's next? Uh, to implement phononic homes and mechanical devices, materials and molecules, and thereby develop engineering applications like quantum information, photochemistry and uh, non-equilibrium phonon transport. So different applications for different uh, physical systems. So phonons are not going to stay alone, right? So it, it can always pair with photons, magnons, plasmons. We are always interested in searching for interesting physics at the interfaces between various uh, physical systems and various uh, fundamental excitations. Um, so, so that's an interesting uh, work to, as an example, I wanted to show it here. So people created a magnetic field uh, from the optically driven phonons. So we have very interesting, very similar system. Uh, one, could be, one could adapt this into these contexts as well. Um, so that's an interesting figure here that shows the optical magnet, optomagnetic effects are really not that significant compared to phonomagnetic effect because there's an optical field that is driving phonons and that is creating magnetic field. It's not optics directly interfacing with the material and producing photons, but it's really exciting phonons first and then that is creating the magnetic field. So that effect is kind of very significant here. Uh, and that creates the effective magnetic field. So there are interesting avenues that one could try with these phonons and can also couple it with phonon papillaritons, try to combine photons and uh, phonons and, and try to create phonon polaritons. It can also couple with other physical systems as well. So the, uh, the, it, it can actually grow in that manner. So, so, so there are three distinct projects under the umbrella of phononic homes. So one is uh, really looking at the fabricated structures. So that is interesting because one can think about other things like diamond related materials. Also, uh, 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 like people have also created edge bars, um, coupling, coupling. So one can couple it with uh, vacancy centers, uh, can couple with spins. So you, one can do all that with the fabricated structures. One can also do that with materials. Uh, synthesized materials, solid state materials. Uh, one can also do the similar sort of experiments with molecules. So there are different interesting things, but they all 
fundamentally have some overlaps between each other. Um, so just to uh, foster creativity among different research directions. So I'm picking these three distinct projects. Um, so to implement, so these are all the things. Uh, so yes, uh, to this end, I'm on the faculty job market to implement these. Okay, so yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you for the talk and leaving a lot of time for questions. So um, maybe I'll ask the first question. <laughs> um, I still, my question is about what determines the length of your frequency comb and does it matter? What does it matter for how many of these equally spaced frequencies you have and how do you control that in your experiments? Um, yes, uh, the, the, that is one of the major metrics in uh, phononic combs that if we could actually have very big massive combs that could be interesting, uh, that could serve as an interesting uh, link from photons uh, to uh, phonons as well. Uh, so how do we control it in experiments? Uh, so right now I've not been concentrating on controlling the numbers of phonon, phonon comb lines, uh, but uh, one could use, use some of the optical control techniques, uh, also try to use the natural advantage of broadband optical combs, somehow try to transfer that bandwidth into phononics through some optomechanical coupling. That is one way I'm thinking about. So one can easily create photonic combs now. So why not use that uh, and then try to transfer that bigger spacing into phononic systems through some optomechanical coupling uh, and, and, and then also boost it even further uh, through some more interesting sophisticated techniques. Uh, so that is, that is something that I could, because there's no other community which actually looks into broadening the combs except these photonic uh, comb community, which is all the time interested in making it bigger. Uh, so that, that we could naturally pick it here and then uh, make it bigger. Um, not, not just in mechanical systems, but also in material system as well, uh, one can, still use the idea from the photonics and transfer it here. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, are there any other questions from anybody else? Please just unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, hi, Adash, I have a question. Uh, could you go to the slide where you show the Hamiltonian? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so this one, or, oh, no, the, the comb Hamiltonian. Maybe it is also here. It is right? also later, yeah. This yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, this one. So so if I think of a, a second, a, a second quantized version, and uh, the last term, uh, where well, so you have the the, cu uh, the cubic term in uh, in Q, right? Um, yeah. Then this is a this is a sort of like the three uh, phonon process. Uh, you uh, create two phonons, annihilate one, or you annihilate two, uh, create one. Uh, yeah. But is there also uh, like four phonon process? I mean, this process that you don't have the the yeah. number of yeah. the total yeah. number of phonons is so not. We can also have other terms, higher order terms. Yeah, uh, so how about those Not terms? in this case. Uh, so in this case, I truncated it because it's not observable in the experiments right now, as of now. So I don't have it, uh, but uh, sometimes it's relevant for some experiments, right? Uh, sometimes those nonlinearities are also physically relevant, uh, but also experimentally possible or feasible. Uh, see, in, in those scenarios, I would have added those as well, but not in this scenario. Okay, so so if I have, I'm, I'm thinking just uh, if I have a four phonon uh, uh, interaction that are uh, dominant, uh, would that give us uh, uh, the frequency comb, or in principle, it, it would not? Should, it, should, it should give. Uh, so technically, it should give, but I'm saying that's not necessary. So three is enough to get combs. 
but four could give as true. Uh, but four is not observed as such in the experiment or explicitly. So that's why I have three. Uh, but four could be there. Uh, it could be even, even the two is not possible at three is not possible at all in some situations. Uh, in, in those scenarios, uh, the three, three, four is what we should be relying on. Okay. Uh, right. And also it depends on the frequency matching conditions. Supposing if your phonon modes frequencies do not ally, align in a manner that the three photon is possible at all. So then uh, you have to rely on something different. Uh, so the frequency matching condition is a key here. Uh, the, the frequencies have to be aligning in a particular integral multiplex. Uh, uh, so that is, there can be some experimental uh, things uh, that will drive such experiments, like experimental challenges that will drive such non-linearities non mm -hmm. uh, for the, for the observation. So if, okay, so, so basically we're saying that if I have a interaction that conserves the total number of phonons, I can, I could still get a, a, a frequency cone. So yes. it's the same, okay. okay. All right, thanks. And maybe also it's interesting, the iron order nonlinearities are interesting to couple with other physical systems, right? Sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question. <laughs> Anybody? Um, so I still don't quite get how these frequency cones develop. It's some kind of interaction between your driving force and the basic modes there through the coupling, and then you get some on different frequencies, but why do they form like a regular spacing of equally spaced phonons? Maybe I should ask, maybe I should learn it first how it happens in photon photonics before I understand it in phonons, but I still miss kind of the basic part. Uh, there are different modes in the system and then your, your, your driving frequency is closer to one of the modes in the systems uh, in the specific scenario and then uh, it interacts it interacts in a manner that it, it, there are so many possibilities to interact, but the, the, the most stable possibility is frequency comb. Uh, that is what I could make it as a conjecture here. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so because there are so many modes, so many excitations in the device, so many modes in the device, there are so many frequencies uh, and the most stable way it produces is a frequency comb. Uh, so, so in your mechanical resonators, your nano size mechanical resonators, does that depend kind of on the geometry that you have different modes that you excite and that are interacting with each other or? Yes, yes, yes. Happened? Those modes are also interacting with each other. So in this case, I can give you an idea here. Uh, so there's this extension compression mode uh, that doesn't use. So there are many modes in these devices, but those modes do not interact that strongly. But the extension mode, since it is stretching and compressing, and mm -hmm. that, that develops a strain energy for the other modes. And, mm -hmm. and that forms an interesting interaction route. Uh, so that is one thing. So for instance, just in my device, I don't have other modes. They, those modes don't interact with each other. It's only if I drive that extension compression mode, that actually couples with the other modes. Uh, so, there's also uh, another thing about the spatial mode profile. So there are, there are always these antinodal and nodal regions in these modes. Um, so if we have more match between the antinodal regions among the modes, then there is more energy transfer, right? So if the modes are, if wherever the nodal regions, so the, if, if those two modes are completely anti-complementary or completely complementary, it's completely distinct, uh, then those don't interact. So, right, so the energy is, there is no route for them to interact. Uh, so spatially also there is a constraint on how the shapes of the modes are. So, which, are, which all could be interesting because supposing if you can localize your, let's say spin fields or your magnetic, like a vacancy centers somewhere in a spatial geometry, 
and then on on the other parts you don't have it so maybe you could potentially use this uh, spatial dependence among the mode coupling together in the mechanical system just a little bit more controllable compared to the spins let's say and uh, in, in which manner you could do some interesting couplings uh, between mechanical and spin systems uh, that is also another route okay um, any other questions from anybody? Well, if not, then let's uh, maybe finish the official part and the recorded part of the session. Let's uh, thank our speaker and um, we'll hang, we'll uh, keep 